Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sarah Hollenbach, and I'm the co-owner of Women and Children First. We're one of the last feminist bookstores in the United States, and we're so excited for tonight's discussion celebrating the release of Auto Theory as Feminist Practice in Art, Writing, and Criticism by Lauren Fournier. Tonight, Lauren will be in conversation with the Lashimi Kupen. We begin our virtual events as we begin our events held in the store with a land acknowledgement. So please join me in acknowledging that the land on which our bookstore stands is the unceded territory of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and Sioux people. Grounding these words in the work, we honor the community organizing being done right now in our city of Chicago by the American Indian Center. We encourage all of you watching from home to um, learn more about the local owner of the room where you are viewing tonight's event. A uh, good place to start is native-land.ca. Women and Children First is currently closed uh, for in-store browsing, but we do offer curbside pickup and we ship anywhere in the United States. Also, we will be reopening for limited in-store browsing on March 10th. So mark your calendars. All of our upcoming virtual events will continue to be held here on Crowdcast for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Um, a few notes, if you haven't bought Lauren's incredible book already, there's a really handy buy the book button located at the bottom of your screen. Um, that will link you to Women and Children First, where you can buy the book and have it shipped or if you're in Chicago, you can pick it up by a curbside pickup. Um, and if you want to ask a question, please, please do so by using the Ask a Question box located at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then Delashini will read the questions for Lauren. All right, on to tonight's event. Lauren Fournier is a writer, curator, and filmmaker who writes auto theories and auto fictions for the page in the screen. She is currently an SSHRC postdoctoral fellow in visual studies, where she is working with Lisa Steele on a studio-based project that extends an auto theoretical approach to critical considerations of whiteness, settler colonialism, and class. She has co-edited co a special issue of the Journal. Um, auto theory with her collaborator, Alex Bostoff, which will be launched at UC Berkeley in May. Um, she also has an auto fictional novel coming out through a fiction advocate later this year. Vilashini Kupan is a professor of literature at the University of California at Santa Cruz where she teaches comparative and world literature with an emphasis on post-colonial theory, genre theory, memory studies, and affect theory. She has an essay on auto theory, forthcoming in a special issue of ASAP. Um, she is also the author of Worlds Within, National Narratives and Global Col Col Connections in Post-Colonial Writing, and is completing a book titled The World at Large, Memory Scripts in World Literature. I'm so excited to listen in to tonight's event um, and hear this fascinating conversation um, in the words of Mackenzie Wark. Lauren Fournier's gift in this book is an audio theory that is much more than self-regard. It becomes a whole series of tactics for thinking and feeling together from the margins of gender, race, ability, and colonialism. So please help me join me in welcoming Volashini Kupan and Lauren Fournier. Thanks so much for an introduction. <laughs> um, thanks everybody for being here. I know we're all a bit zoomed out. I guess we're in Crowdcast now, but 
yeah, I, I really appreciate you all being here. Um, so, and I'm speaking today from Treaty 4 lands in Saskatchewan. This is the traditional ancestral territories of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and um, Métis Nation, Métis and Michif, uh, from, you know, which the land on which I'm living as a white settler. And, yeah. So, Flashing, should I dive in with a reading? Yeah, okay. Oh, hmm, I think that might be Is that your mic. Like, like, like reverb that you're hearing? Okay. Is it better now? Can you hear me now, I think? I can't hear you now though, so one second. I'm sorry, everybody. I thought I was gonna use this like fancy microphone, but I'll stick to the headphones. Um. I can't actually hear you blushing. I'm so sorry. Here, wait one sec. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Testing. Hello. I still can't hear you. can't hear you. Is All right, that so that I will start. Okay, it's still giving reverb. Still giving reverb. I wonder if you have like a headphone, maybe? Go ahead. Oh. Go ahead. That is like a very, yeah, that's a trippy sound. All right, so. Um, okay, so I'm going to be reading from the conclusion of my book. I'm just going to read for about 10 minutes and then Lashini and I will be in conversation. So it was hard to find a passage that was readable within about 10 minutes. So basically, I'm just going to give you some context for when this part of the yeah, essentially where this anecdote is coming from. So the scene is that I'm at Congress at UBC Vancouver in 2019. I'm still hearing some weird sound stuff. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm like. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading. Keep reading. Okay. All right. So, um, so I'm at Congress. This is acute. It's the Association um, for Canadian College and University Teachers of English. Some of you may have been there. David Cheriandi is a writer of auto fiction and. Um, well-known figure in Black Canadian literary studies and practice, and a mentor and friend of mine. And he was giving the keynote address in which he was presenting this performance that he wrote entitled Theory of Footnote. And in it, he was responding auto-fictionally, but I would also say quite auto-theoretically that not much was necessarily fictionalized, but he was responding to Dion Brown's 2019 novel Theory. And he was writing about his experience at what he was calling Why University, which as he went on to describe it as the more kind of like working class university on the outskirts of Toronto, et cetera, et cetera. It became clear he was referring to York University where I was finishing up my uh, PhD in English. And the kind of inside joke of what York University signified as a university that's more conducive as he put it to certain cultural um, class-based and race-based difference. And that he as a you know, emerging black scholar and graduate student at the time, but also specifically as a first generation university student was writing about his process and experience. Um, yeah, doing a PhD in literature. So this was, I kind of write through that anecdote in the conclusion, which I should note is entitled, um, whew, okay, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. It's entitled Auto Theory in Decolonial Times. And so here is just a little glimpse of the uh, of my reflection. So um, I sat so I sat there still reverberating from the performance. I could still feel the words first generation student vibrating in me knowingly. 
It was common for people to assume that first generation students were also recent immigrants, an assumption that frustrated me and made me wonder why my parents and my grandparents and everyone before me, whom I knew so little about, where had they come from and why had they come here, hadn't attended college or university themselves. Even though I lacked the privileges of a college fund, I had the privileges of my whiteness, my settler background, and the possibilities for class mobility that came with that, my apparently able body, and my learned Protestant work ethic that had become compulsive, even self-harmful over the course of my life. I then listened as Cherry Andy described, through cutting diction, the protagonists, and auto-fictionalized him, own self-harm. The character, a young black man and a perceptive student of literature and theory, exercises until he vomits, studies until it's time to sleep every day, the rigor of his self-scheduling to attain the success of climbing academia's ladder, also that he could get through graduate school and write the kind of work he wants to write. Theory here is enmeshed in pain. Following his discussions of representations of black masculinity in academia and the self-immolation required to be sufficiently rigorous, Cheriandi proffers a definition of theory as typically understood. This definition is written to his younger self, explaining the racial dimensions of this so-called elevated discourse and addressing with a honed incisiveness, similar to the artist Goth Shakira's Latinx femme memes, the unsettling politics of opacity. And this is a quote from David Cheriandi. Theory, real theory would appear to be white, although increasingly it can be liberally applied to the non-white, thus affording the raw cultural cash crops of darkness, precious opportunities of explication and refinement. Of course, of late, there have been nods among real theorists to certain so-named post-colonialists, especially those whose writings are agreeably opaque. Itself a high it's indication. Itself a high indication of theoretical sophistication, like being an asshole or having a penis. That's the end quote of Cherry Andy's quote. With these words, Cherry Andy addresses one of the problems at the heart of the auto-theoretical turn. What constitutes real theory? Why has theory historically been the purview of white people and what does this mean for the possibility of decolonializing theory? Why is the realness of theory predicated on its opacity? Why could the way of practicing real theory be summed up in the word asshole? And why was this joke so resonant with the academic audience listening and laughing? Weren't we the ones teaching and reinscribing this language? And couldn't we change it if we really wanted? After the applause, David received a standing ovation. He was flooded with people coming up to him at the front of the room, shaking his hand and praising his work. Admiring scholars basked in his intelligence and self-respect, his sense of humor and humility. Later that week, I would receive an email sent from Acute, and shortly thereafter, um, the Women's and Gender Studies Department expressing their outrage at an incident of racial profiling by UBC security guards and the RCMP against a young black male scholar at Congress. A series of similar statements would be released denouncing the anti-Black racism and seeking to make amends for their unwitting complicity. The scholar who had been racially profiled was Shelby McPhee, who had traveled from Nova Scotia to present his research as part of the Canadian Black Studies Association. He was wrongly accused of stealing a laptop and then stalked and harassed by campus security. If anyone had the misconception that structural racism was no longer an issue, even in a context where people were gathering to speak about these very issues, they were mistaken. Maybe Hegel was wrong. History isn't teleological and process isn't, progress isn't teleological either. I thought of other recent political murmurings, like the desire to ban abortion or the possibility that gay marriage rights may be rescinded. When progressive changes are made, it doesn't mean that those incremental changes are here to stay. For those like black scholars in academia um, who have been marginalized and oppressed, that kind of progressive change is something that must continue to be fought for. Quote, and this is happening in 2019, I overheard one white scholar say to another, shaking their heads as they rode the bus downtown after the conference. And in Vancouver, quote, well, there really aren't a lot of black people here, end quote, another scholar said, with a pained expression, quote, in Vancouver, they added to clarify. As I've historicized and contextualized in this book, the tendency toward working auto-theoretically emerges out of and crystallizes through women and others and women's bodies as living and thinking in a world that given patriarchal and colonial structures might be hostile to them. But the work that auto theory does in breaking down hierarchies and systemic oppression, even within ourselves, makes it by those very characteristics an apt model for all of us, 
as Chiriandi intuits, no matter one's class, race, gender, or background. This is arguably the radicality of auto theory as a mode that has the potential to be egalitarian and accessible. Through the exchange between the autobiographical and the critical, it allows those who are living their lives reflexively and with criticality and awareness to theorize from their lived positionings and to engender knowledge and insight from the specificities of their body minds, thriving in relation to others with whom they might have affinities as well as points of difference, even dissension. While this might seem a utopic promise, one that might at first appear overly optimistic, I think the range of works emerging over the past half century that engage auto theory in subversive and liberatory ways points to the possibly radical and ethical capacities for auto theory as an inclusive mode with deep feminist roots. Um, yeah, maybe I'll end there. That was, that was a maybe, bit maybe we should, should we start there? Sure, yeah. And are you hearing me? Yes. We no longer have an experimental sound performance, but. Excellent. <laughs> um, well, I want to start by asking you to switch away the book's method. Though it's a new book in a new field, it uh, devotes a lot of attention to genealogies and periodizations. You talk about, in the speculative way, you imagine what might each Sedgwick have thought had she had the vocabulary of 2000s and 2010s gender queer non-binary trans epistemologies rather than the 80s and 90s vocabularies you read adrian, adrian piper's work on kant and surface kant's auto theoretical murmurings and draw a line from Kant's phenomenology to Piper's own work. So you create these wonderful, strange bedfellows, uh, mm -hmm. unforeseen contacts. Your version of auto theory keeps leaping over divisions of space and time. I wonder if you could say something about why your genealogies are so important to you in this book and how you are resisting reproductive or normative lines of defense, dissent, and instead braiding or making theoretical kin. So why genealogy? Thank you, that's a really beautiful question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would say that, you know, the initial, one of the initial impulses driving my writing of this book was to historicize this term auto theory. So, you know, for those who might not be aware, this was a term that was being used to describe a lot of literary texts, specifically coming out of a queer feminist American kind of literary niche in the 2010s and seemed to be really resonant with a lot of writers and artists and especially like artists and writers who exist in the liminal place of art practice and writing, which it tends to be the, we can't avoid the headphones. Um, but yeah. And so, yeah, so basically, you know, I, I felt like I needed to historicize this term. I was also resistant to the idea of writing a genealogy specifically. And so I don't necessarily see what I'm doing or my method as a genealogical one um, because A, I was aware of perhaps the impossibility of finding an actual origin point or some kind of like originary moment. And instead I wanted to trace every moment in which this term has arisen. So, you know, uh, a bubbling up in like late nineties with Stacey Young's book or even like Mika Ball documentary filmmaker who is using this term to describe her work. And then we have, you know, folks who just uh, described Gloria Ian Zaldua's Borderlands, La Frontera from 1987 in this, um, in terms of what she's doing with writerly experimentation and form. And then looking back to a longer history, specifically a feminist art practice, because, um, you know, it occurred to me that that would be yeah, a good place to start. <laughs> so, um, and based on my own just background, I was interested in histories of conceptualism and performance and body art and video. So that became, I guess, the kind of archives that I was looking at um, through this idea of auto theory and the challenge then, especially, you know, chapter one starts with, uh, here's the book, by the way. Hello. 
Um, chapter one starts with Adrienne Piper's 1971 piece, Food for the Spirit, and where she's engaging with Kant. And all of a sudden I had this moment where it's like, actually, you know, we might see auto theory as this mode that's confronting dominant forms of theory and philosophy. And yet there are also these autobiographical, as you, yeah, like murmurings, reverberations within the dominant forms of philosophy and theory themselves. So that's when it occurred to me, okay, I actually have to, you know, look at Derrida and Marx and Freud and Nietzsche and, you know, the autobiographical moments in those thinkers too, which I talk a bit about in this book. So, you know, I'm primarily coming at it from this like perspective of feminist practices. I think this, there's a tie here to genre and genealogy too, where I was a little bit resistant to thinking about defining auto theory as a genre, I think precisely because it can become over-determining. And so thinking about it as a practice was a way of describing this as something that's that artists and writers are doing across disciplines and across media and forms. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I want to follow up with another question about the feelings, the affects of working with, uh, as you say, high theory and conceptual practices. And one of the things you do in the book is talk about different artists' experience of uh, their encounter with theory. Adrienne Piper's Food for the Spirit is a sacrificial mode. She is reading Kant's first critique while starving, literally starving, ruminating on an empty stomach. Other artists talk about the the miseries and the exclusions and the outsiderness that comes with theory, which I think the reading that you were you started us off with also speaks to. Um, there's a there's a way in which theory is a an enforced diet in doctoral programs, and it's one, as you say, <laughs> that can leave us hungry. I was really struck when I read the book about the many ways that artists push back against uh, these, these bad feelings, these bad theoretical feelings. There is irreverence, there is playfulness, there is anger, there is joy, there is pleasure. And I wonder if you could talk about the affects of coming to terms with theory through this project, mm -hmm. right? Both for yourself and in the artists you work with. Yeah. Another, um, yeah, really beautiful question. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think there's this fundamentally kind of ambivalent affect that seems to drive a lot of the artists and writers who are working where there's, you know, I think of like Hazel, Meyer, Hazel Myers, No Theory, No Cry, or even Sona, the cover image, you know, with the book of, if folks haven't seen it, Sona Safai's um, work, which is, you know, creating this kind of theory brandscape of the various theorists and artists that she was required to read when she was doing her MFA at OCAD. And interestingly enough, Hazel Myers, No Theory, No Cry also came out of a grad program at OCAD. Um, so maybe there's something about, you know, how theory is being enforced as a diet, as you said, but the, fundamentally there's something ambivalent because it, I guess it's almost kind of like a painful pleasure, maybe like a jouissance. It's like, um, you know, the desire to, to read and engage with these texts and to, in a sense, you know, uh, yeah, like, yeah, this metaphor of digestion, you know, you're incorporating it into yourself, or it's becoming assimilated as part of your body, you know, the processing or digesting of theory, you know, and the affects that come up. And I think many of these works arose precisely because they felt there wasn't adequate space for their affect, and they felt that there wasn't adequate space for their embodiment, which also comes through in the Cherry Andy performance and so you know addressing a kind of limitation within the institutional structures that teach artists and are training artists but also within perhaps the ways that theory is is written and or read and so auto theory responds by making space for the body the self you know the self who's processing their own life and affective responses and you know gut responses Th alongside that intellectual process that it's resisting this, you know, still omnipresent tendency, I think, in in education systems and something I'm addressing as I'm teaching on Zoom and we're talking about the body. Because it's like, yeah, this this 
this desire to kind of separate ourselves and just get into the mind and have this kind of heady, transcendent, abstracting conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm so glad that you brought up the body uh, and gut and digestion and metaphors and practices of um, incorporation. Because there's a, there's a moment in Hazel Meyer's No Theory, No Cry, where she has a piece, um, I wonder if I can hold up a picture of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this beautiful piece. And she also accompanies it with a text that reads, theory helps, theory hinders, a tumultuous relationship the artistic process, a prosthetic axis, a simultaneous conquer and defeat, no theory, no cry, is the possibility to double back and inform the teeth that bite your ass. So I'm really interested <laughs> in, the, in the teeth that bite in Adrian Piper's mouth that does not swallow food while she reads Kant and does an auto-theoretical reflection on Kant. You elsewhere talk about um, cannibalizing as one mode of auto-theoretical engagement with theory. I know you work on gut practices, but can you, can you talk about the importance of uh, the elementary in foregrounding the body? because it's, it's unavoidable and it orients us, as you say, away from abstraction. So I'd love you to, to explore the elementary mode of auto theory. Yeah, I mean, this is when I finally realized that everything I'm interested in is connected. I have a tendency to try to like section off, uh, God knows why. I mean, I'm, I'm encouraged to bridge, bridge these things, but, um, you know, yeah, I guess all that academic training and like specialization, but yes, fermentation has been like a long standing interest of mine and ideas of microbes and microbial life and microbiomes and like the how the microbiological world is, um, you know, I think a really compelling way of approaching the ways that, you know, not only that we are always already more than ourselves because we're constituted by billions of bacteria, but we're also you know, the line between where my body ends and your body begins isn't so clear. So as far as the the kind of digestion element that runs through this book, to be honest, that wasn't super conscious, but I think it, it is coming through in so many of the works precisely because of this idea of processing, I would say. So if, if auto theory is a, is a practice of processing one's lived experience, one's autobiographical materials, alongside the theoretical, um, you know, critical, textual, discursive materials, then it's like that constant shuttling that you find in a lot of auto-theoretical writing and artwork. And, you know, maybe this is where the vagus nerve comes in. People don't know if it's B-A-G-U-S, but it's becoming empirically, scientifically backed up now as like the nerve that connects our, our gut and our mind and like our brain. And there's something about that that I find really compelling um, yeah. in having a kind of like scientific grounding for this body-mind connection, that, that auto-theoretical work in wanting to bridge, you know, theory and practice, art and life, mind and body, and the ways that long-standing feminist histories of feminist philosophy and activism have been, you know, saying these are inextricable, like these are not binary oppositions, they've been saying these for like, you know, a long time. So. Absolutely. And one of the things you talk about is the ways discourse and language can also be consumed, can be made proximate. We can touch somebody through a quotation or mm -hmm. through the um, a citational practice. You have a wonderful phrase, um, autotheoretical citationality as intertextual intimacy which is so embodied, um, it makes us think about the skin of words. Uh, it makes us think about what it might mean to swallow somebody's words, to literally incorporate them. And a whole set of ethical 
questions start to emerge when we think about this um, capacity of citationality to bring bodies and histories and eyes uh, into contact. So could you say more about this intimate mode? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's a great question. Hmm, mm -hmm. So it's almost like, you know, in thinking about this auto-theoretical turn, one question I had to address really early on in the book, and, and it's there in the introduction, the intro gives kind of like history of the term, but is the politics of narcissism. So if there's anything, you know, that starts with an auto, we have these various neologisms, auto theory, auto fiction. Um, Jean Randolph is here, shout out, shout out to fictocriticism. Um, these various neologisms that, uh, you know, circulate in the orbit of this auto theoretical work. And this question of is a turn to the self you know, and this act quite literally of self-looking is that, you know, inherently narcissistic in, in the sense of being, well, as Freud would put it, you know, inherently feminine, petty, uncritical, naive, etc., and that women have a compulsion to, you know, image themselves and see themselves as kind of separate from themselves. And, and so with this book, you know, thinking about auto-theoretical work as any practice that has an element of the autobiographical, the subject centered, the embodied alongside theory, sometimes that is a, a self-imaging practice, sometimes that's a more memoiristic writing practice. And so the, yeah, the, polit the politics and aesthetics of narcissism in relation to this work was something I was really wrestling with for a while. And I think that where citation comes in is that's where you get outside of the self and start to connect to the other. So through, you know, just the way that these texts tend to be constituted and constructed and, and presented is, yeah, th this element of citationality, you know, for anyone who's might not be aware of what I'm talking about here, you know, just right. literally referencing others, you know, we tend to see it as a historically, like uh, we tend to see it as an academic research rate based practice. So, you know, cite your sources, um, you know, make sure you're tracing the lines of, of influence and knowledge and make sure, you know, you're, you have a sense of where this point came from and you're able to trace that and back that up. And you see artists and, and I take up a whole range of like really experimental approaches to, to citing. Um, as Vlashny noted, you know, yes, as like a, a form of intimacy and, and community and communion with others. And this question of, you know, who someone who someone cites and, and, and why and to what effect is something I was also really interested in, that the fact that we each have different points of reference and different contexts and how limited, you know, a certain approach to auto theory could be if you only are seeing like French post-structuralism as theory, for example, or, you know, I've done like a ton of research on Chris Krauss's work and she is one of my favorite writers. And, you know, I know that she's also rife with problematics, but um, I do really love her work and think she's presented some really invaluable contributions to this form. But yeah, I mean, she would be looking primarily at that kind of semi-text French post-structuralist line of thought, but that's only one of many and um, yeah. I mean, I have a couple books here I want to give shout outs to, but um, like Marquis cool. Space, Them Goon Rules has a whole other element of like an archive that I don't talk about in my book because I hadn't read it until it came out after my book was done. And um, Lindsay Nixon's Natissanak, um, which I also highly recommend is kind of recent auto theoretical modes that have, you know, or even like Mackenzie Works. I just have like so many books around me right now. Mackenzie Works <laughs> Reverse Cowgirl. Um, but yeah, where each of these have like very different citational landscapes and forms yeah. of intimacy. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that you held up these books and talked about citationality because it lets us get at questions of what is feminist and decolonial about an auto-theoretical practice. So when you talked about how we sometimes in academia use footnotes to shore us up to give us authority. Uh, I can't say it myself, but I can say it through quoting this other person. It's almost a kind of like armor. And mm -hmm. one of the things that the writers you work with and the artists you work with do is to poke some holes in the armor. Uh, 
right? To open up through citational intimacy, the prospect of speaking alongside rather than speaking through someone. That's your beautiful mm -hmm. phrase that citationality is speaking alongside. I'm also thinking about the, um, the collectivities that can form and the communities that can coalesce through this mode. So, you know, the, the tension between a dangerously narcissistic I and the building of a we is, is, is in the shadows all the time when you're talking about how auto theory is, is seen. And you've talked about that. I wonder if, you could say a little bit more about what is constitutively decolonial and feminist about auto theory for you. Mm. It, it really seems that's true. Yeah, that's a big question. It's some of the examples that you yeah. work with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's a it's an important question. It's like I'm just trying to think where to where to begin. I mean. I guess one thing I also want to note is this idea, just kind of last point on that idea of like the intertextual intimacies and identifications, you know, what are we like gravitated toward and, um, you know, and then what do we then kind of reproduce and, and replicate through our work. Um, I feel like that that's certainly tied to a queer feminist tradition and specifically queer feminist affect theory. and. We referenced Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick earlier, but I feel like she, you know, was using that language of the side, like in a lot of her autotheoretical writings in the 90s and, and thinking about, you know, yeah, um, you know, writing alongside uh, as a citational practice. So, yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of what is feminist, I mean, there's a few different strains, you know, like on the one quite simple level, if we, if we think back to kind of like a second wave American feminism, the idea of the personal is political. I feel like what auto theory is doing is it's like the personal is political, but also philosophical and also theoretical. So there's this, um, yeah, tendency. And, and like I noted, you know, um, really wanting to break down these boundaries between these kind of false divides that we create between one's life and one's work and the stakes of that. So, you know, I have a whole chapter on the feminist politics of exposure and disclosure and, you know, cancel or well, call out culture and cancel culture, I guess, but yeah, call out culture is certainly a key part of that. And I write through a few different anecdotes, really trying to take a quite nuanced approach to the subject um, because you know, I, I, well, I write about this a bit in the book, but I always remember, you know, when I was an undergrad or even in my master's, I guess about a decade ago, reading literary theory, there was no discussion of the writer's life. So, um, you know, Louis Althusser, you're, you're reading his work on practice and like kind of neo-Marxist theory on ideology, but you're not, there's no awareness of the fact that he murdered his wife you know, um, with his bare hands, strangled her. So there's like these moments where you're like, you're just not aware of that. And it's not even a part of the conversation. And I feel like now we're the pendulum swinging where it's like, we won't even engage with the work because of the lived action. You know, there's such a kind of um, quite rapid shift in the last decades. So I, I think about that and the ways that auto theoretical work both is, you know, part of the context in which we are taking more seriously the lived behavior of artists and writers and theorists, but also, you know, um, yeah, just kind of reflecting on that. I know when I was talking about, with Mackenzie Wark about this um, on the MIT Press podcast, the way she put it was she was like, you know, because I was like, yeah, you know, because auto theory is a way to think about the ethics of your life and, you know, want to be more of an ethical person. And she was like a little bit wary, like she was like, well, yes, but we also need room for like young people to be able to fuck up. <laughs> And she's like, can we actually approach this more dialectically, you know, and not be so kind of purists um, in policing behavior either? So, yeah, so the book, you know, does a kind of deep dive into these questions um, in, a, in a contemporary feminist context. That's so great. And you do such a beautiful job of bringing out the stakes of auto theory. So I was just thinking, listening to you now, that there's a way in which the disclosure the vulnerability that's built into theorizing from your life and 
telling your own story, that that disclosure is an act of bravery, right? Uh, it's one that can also open you to various kinds of public um, charges or judgments or evaluations. But I'm curious about what we can do with that bravery, right? You, you, there's a wonderful moment in the chapter you just referenced where you describe being at a um, an academic talk and feeling that even in a room of people committed to auto theoretical work, it wasn't possible to stay with difficult questions, right? That, it, it, what do we do if our auto theory makes us brave about ourselves, but not necessarily brave to, to ask what you call questions needing answers um, to pursue the possibility of transformational politics about the aesthetic as well as the um, the ethical. Uh, so, so what what about the bravery? Yeah, no, I, I yeah, hmm. I love that point, flushing because I, I honestly hadn't really thought about it as bravery, but it's true, and that tends to be the language used when people you know are really honest. Um, like I gave a keynote a couple of weeks ago at a conference on empathy and everyone kept telling me how brave it was, <laughs> but to the point where I would like then felt shame after, like, I was like, was it actually too much? Like, I, cause I didn't actually think it, I was being brave at all, but, um, but yeah, there's something about honesty and authenticity, which are both terms that, you know, academics have a hard time with. <laughs> it's like, can someone be honest and authentic and sincere? You know, it's so much easier to be like ironic or. Yeah, I don't know, but um, that's something that I've certainly thought about with auto theoretical writing because I, I do think there's an effort on behalf of a lot of these writers to toward a kind of honesty and you know, is that always a kind of performance in, in writing is, it, is a, a big question I know in, in literature, but yeah, this idea of being brave about ourselves but not necessarily, I mean, I almost wonder if it's like, you know, not being willing to I feel like we're in a moment right now where we're not really willing to give other people the benefit of the doubt. And in a way it kind of precludes that possibility of the we that you mentioned, like the shift from the I to the we, that there's, you know, a real kind of paranoia of, of like the other right now, which tends to be like an ideological other. Um, yeah. yeah. There's a kind of ethics of mutual exposure hmm. in a way, like, like, like mm -hmm. a, I'll show you something about me, you show me. Does that does that figure, for example, into a classroom setting where you are? I know you're right now teaching a seminar on auto theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, my, I mean, my grad class, I feel like it's been, I've been surprised at how just like, yeah, honest and generous everyone is being and everyone's actually be, kind of having each other's backs. And maybe that's by virtue of, of the kind of program that it is where it's like a smaller cohort and there is a sense of, you know, support across difference. And there's like a real, um, yeah, attempt to kind of wrestle through questions, but yeah. Um, but no, I, I like how you put it, this ethics of mutual disclosure that maybe it's, you know, maybe trust comes in there a bit or empathy. I know there's a tension between like, yeah, sympathy as, you know, we were talking about this before, like another time, but yeah, sympathy as like, you know, being predicated already on sameness versus empathy is difference. And so maybe being able to actually see across uh, the line or across, um, yeah, being able to kind of get outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's very helpful. I wanted to invite people to put questions into uh, where did exactly do you, you I think you type it in and it shows up and ask a question at the base of the screen. And then I'm happy to read those uh, and have Loren respond. So if you wanna start putting those in, I have a few other things that we could, we could talk about while questions are coming in. And I'll keep an eye on that. Um, let's see. I wonder if we could talk about your archive. Thank you. Yes. Click on ask a question and type it there. So auto theory is new, but it is rapidly coalescing 
right? It's, it's, it's gaining authority. It is producing special issues like the ones you and Alex Rostov have um, edited books, um, various other uh, university syllabi. It will more than your own qualifying exams will be dedicated <laughs> to auto theory. So there's a danger that it will become a theory commodity, right? Something not unlike the cover image, right? Which if you can't yeah. see this, they're, they're logo brand names of well-known theorists yeah. on a Louis Vuitton bag. So I wonder how the turn to art and artistic objects and artistic practices for you interrupts the uh, upload of auto theory into the theory industrial machine. It's now the next new hot thing. We know what it is. We, we can digest it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there something about working with your particular archive, right? Which, which deals with some very well-known texts in auto theory, like Maggie Nelson's The Arcanauts, like Preciado, like Chris Krause. But it also surfaces what I earlier called auto theory strange bedfellows, Immanuel Kant. <laughs> um, uh, you talk about Fanon beautifully. Uh, you talk about uh, women of color and queer feminism in the 80s um, and 90s. And you do this through art practices. So what, what does your archival shift do to the uh, the object of, of auto theory. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, yeah, I would say that the way I'm imagining auto theory in this book and the way I'm kind of imagining it in relation to our current context of, you know, so I, I'm very much aware that we are in this like neoliberal kind of period. I, I do wonder how the pandemic will shift that though, to be honest. But, you know, when I was, when I wrote the book, thinking about neoliberalism and this like, constant turn and compulsion toward individualism and the self thinking about late late capitalism and you know i think auto theory has the capacity to actually resist this idea of being the next shiny new thing yes by virtue of the fact that it it isn't necessarily new like there's that kind of tension between like oh this is new you know like technically yeah i guess this book is like you know the first book on the subject and yet it has these murmurings you know a long long history of this kind of work and it's just a matter of um, you know, consolidating and, and historicizing and theorizing that. But yeah, that that it in a way you start to see, okay, actually, you know, even folks like Clarice Lispector's writings right now being kind of rediscovered as philosophical. And there's a lot of really interesting work happening there. She's features a little bit in my book, but not extensively. You have these, yeah, folks who actually, you know, didn't necessarily make it into the canon because they slipped through the cracks of legibility by virtue of them having these strange practices. So being, you know, a writer who makes sound work or, you know, an artist who actually has a writing practice and um, folks who tend to, yeah, uh, work in ways that don't fit comfortably within pre-existing genre categories. And so I think What's really cool about auto theory when you start to look at it and as part of a larger longer history of of this idea of like an auto theoretical impulse that yeah there's a, it, it it resists this kind of teleological like um yeah way of thinking it resists this idea of of newness you know as much as we can resist the treadmill of newness within like art and publishing and, you know, academia, where there's that kind of compulsion to, you know, do, be, be doing something new and different. But I think, you know, being able to look back at history and like recycle and yeah, ferment and <laughs> compost and, um, you know, maybe <laughs> different metaphors that can help save the earth. Well, yeah, that um, kind of know, cycling yeah, that back good. instead of a telos. That's great. So mm -hmm. we have some questions in the in the chat. Um, a couple of them are about this idea of, of genre. So one person asks, can you distinguish or how do you distinguish between auto theory and autobiography? Mm -hmm. And somebody else wanted to uh, ask about autoethnography. So maybe you could put those all yeah. together. 
For sure. Yeah, no, they're both really great questions and questions that come up a lot. Um, I was expecting that someone was going to say auto theory and auto fiction, because that was a question I was trying to answer in my whole grad class this morning. Um, but yeah, so auto theory and autobiography. I mean, I initially I would have said that the way you would distinguish it is that auto theory has some kind of direct, explicit, reflexive referencing to the realm of theory and philosophy or some awareness of what it's doing as being part of like a philosophical project. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, as we see in Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts where you have a memoir and then in the margins of the page, there are different like philosophers and theorists being referenced. Um, you know, that would be the most explicit, obvious example um, where you're using like the layout of the mise en page to actually show that shuttling. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the lines are necessarily super clear. And there is that whole genre of the autobiographical novel, which also makes things more complicated in relation to autofiction. Um, so I, I really think it's a matter to some extent of the context that gives rise to these different genre descriptors. So I, I think historically memoir and autobiogra autobiography and life writing have been feminized and therefore seen as less intellectually valid. And so something you see a tendency, I mean, many auto people whose work has been described as auto-theoretical, I'm thinking of Chris Cross and Maggie Nelson because they are two people who explicitly said, my work is not memoir, my work is not, or you know, Chris Cross said, I love Dick happened in real life, but it is not a memoir. And that's like a direct quote. And so there's this desire to actually distance themselves from these previous genre categories, which is something I, I interrogate a bit in the book, you know, why, why this tendency to try to distance what you're doing from these previous genres. And, and I do think it's because memoir is seen as not necessarily having that intellectual critical element that auto theory is bringing out and kind of pulling out. But I do think about, you know, maybe the future of this, this form of writing maybe the ways that that this that theorizing and philosophizing element will come in might be a bit more nuanced and therefore become closer to this idea of autobiography right that's so helpful because um there's a way in which genre is already always already freighted with gender right that the memoir mm -hmm. Because of its drawing from life and being embodied, it gets positioned as a particularly female kind of um, uh, genre. Or we can think about the ways like the Romana Clay works or the Confession. And so I, I, I love this idea that auto theory's resistance to genre goes hand in hand with how it wants to break gender open. Right. If, if, if genre has sometimes been used to type gender and vice versa, which is what Derrida says, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that seems so interesting to you in auto theory is, is how it fragments and reassembles gender, how it proliferates categories of gender mm -hmm. and sexuality. Um, so I'm just, I'm just thinking about that as we make sense of, of why, why an established language for criticism, like genre categories, whether you're talking about art or literature, just don't mm -hmm. hold here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't have to, well, maybe, to give another well, question. Yeah. Actually, and I think this will be a good way for me to address the autoethnography question because I haven't Wonderful. yet. So, because because I'll, I'll weave in the, the two because um, I, I certainly see the autoethnography being tied to auto theory, not necessarily being completely different. But I think autoethnography, of course, specifically coming from uh, the the discipline of anthropology um, and practices of ethnography. But in the case of autoethnography, you know, um, wanting to like know the self. So I, in that way, I think the drive is very similar to auto theory. And so I, I do include a discussion of autoethnography within this history. I, I It was certainly the first way I came to this kind of work. When I did my master's, I wrote it as a performative autoethnography. <laughs> um, and that was out of a literary department, you know, maybe because auto theory and auto fiction weren't really being used as terms then. 
Um, but that was a similar, quite similar approach that I took in this book of, if, you know, writing through certain anecdotes. In that case, it was a kind of self-reflective um, study of a specific like coffee shop and kind of gender, gender politics and issues of access in this, um, you know, East Vancouver cafe. So yeah, I think autoethnography, you know, it's a question that's coming up a lot because I think there are artists who are like, okay, well, my work has been described as autoethnography, you know, is, does auto theory kind of fit in here too? I, I certainly think that there's an overlap. Mm -hmm. That's great. We have another question and it is about autofiction. Uh, is auto theory a way to interpret or a way to name an object? To clarify, if it isn't personal narrative about theory, but about fiction, is it auto fiction and not auto theory? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, the way I've been thinking about the distinction, well, one thing I've been telling my grad students, because this is coming up a lot, is, you know, kind of thinking, I, I kind of think of it as like constellating of like auto theory and fiction. And so, you know, they can kind of interact in different ways. Mackenzie work put it as practices of, of fictioning and facting, which I quite liked as well. That is actually, you know, choosing to um, fiction sometimes in your writing and, and maybe have that element of fictionalization, fabrication, uh, changing details um, versus the facting of, you know, recollecting. Of course, the then the slippery thing is like, well, all memoir is recollection from memory. Memory is you know, not always super trustworthy and, and it is embodied and subjective. And so there, there is a certain logical line of thought that would say like any attempt at writing the self is, is a kind of fiction as well. So that's something I'm aware of. I, yeah, but I think, you know, auto fiction as a term to describe objects of study as this person's question kind of opened with uh, is, tends to be canonized specifically in a French literary tradition. So starting with like Serge Dubrovsky, Hervé Guibert, a lot of like gay male French writers who uh, it's auto fictional because they are writing stories from life, but there is that kind of thinly veiled fiction or um, what's sometimes described as even just like a facade of fiction. So sometimes maybe it's just like the changing of a name, um, you know, and maybe that's because of issues of libel and slander <laughs> that there might actually be like logistical legalistic reasons rather than creative ones or they might be creative ones well i, I know that you were working on your own auto fictional auto theoretical novel right is that correct and were you doing yes. this at the same time as reading writing this book and what was that like <laughs> attempting to <laughs> um yeah I mean, I guess it maybe it's better described as a novella, but it's, um, I have the initial inspiration here. So this is um, Fiction Advocate does a series of books written in response to other books that are like auto fictional. So this is Genevieve Hudson's A Little In Love With Everybody, with everyone rather, A Little In Love With Everyone. And Genevieve, they just published a really, really fantastic novel that's getting a lot of a really good press called The Boys of Alabama which I'm looking forward to reading, but the afterwards series is essentially literary criticism and creative nonfiction mixed with auto fiction. So, uh, and I'll, so I, I have one coming out at the end of, uh, well, if I'm, if I make my next deadline, it'll be in early fall, but, uh, on Chris Krause's I Love Dick. So it's going to be kind of auto fictional account of a kind of coming of age in East Vancouver in relation to issues of like legibility and articulation and, um, knowledge and gender and yeah. And what, what was the experience like of being able to work in a fictional sphere about these questions? I know you were having an active curating life because um, that's part of your work. You are of course teaching and you're in the classroom and then you're writing an academic book about auto theory. And it seems to me that you were swimming in so, in so many currents that surely that had an impact on, on the porousness that, that you've been able to see and bring out in the in auto theory as a practice, you know? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I really like that way of thinking, but I hadn't really thought about it that way. Yeah, I mean, 
I think I, hmm. yeah, I, I think I just like working in a bunch of different modes and, and maybe that's why I tend to be gravitated toward some of the, the folks I include in the book are, are people who like to like write and make art and curate. And there's kind of like shuttling between media. I mean, I wonder if it's my own coming of age was in art school. Um, well, actually I was a science student and a uh, visual art, but it was, you know, thinking about this idea of intermedia and the philosophy of intermedia is like, you start with a concept and then whatever form or medium makes sense to kind of like execute that concept or explore that concept is the path that you take. So maybe that's partly what's driving that. And maybe what I, what I see, how I see the auto theoretical impulse manifesting too, is that it's a kind of drive or um, desire to kind of like understand one's life and theorize oneself. And, you know, at the risk of using pretty like capitalistic language, like producing concepts from one's life that, yeah, can, can take shape, you know, maybe it, maybe it takes the form of an exhibition for some folks, you know, maybe it takes the form of an installation, a film, sound work, novel, poetry, like it, 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 it isn't limited by form. That's true. Well, I mean, and I think that's one of the anti-capitalist promises in this mode. I mean, it can easily, you know, be commodified, right? Mm -hmm. And then it can also, <laughs> invite us to think about the self as a multimedial practice, right? That we don't just have to produce ourselves through whatever is the most uh, consumable and normal, normal, normative form, a tweet or an image or whatever is the latest ideology of the self. So there's something about your own multimedial engagement with the field you're studying with auto theory and how that reflects back on the very many different ways you're able to be yourself in concert with different communities different collaborators different mm -hmm. objects so is there something about the the heterogeneity of the the, the difference right? That auto theory surfaces. It doesn't surface an I. It surfaces something that is a multiplicity of voices loosely cohering <laughs> as an I. And, and why is, why is that insurgent? I think mm. it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I feel like we're, we see that kind of all around us, or at least I, I'll speak for myself, I see that all around me. Um, you know, there is this kind of real tension right now in culture. It feels like, like kind of, I guess, speaking from a kind of North American discursive culture of like, yeah, both a, a kind of turn to the self and understanding the self, but, but a desire to also still connect. And yeah, I mean, thinking about, you know, yeah, both sameness and difference or thinking about, yeah, maybe, yeah, this idea of like multiplicity is, is a nice way of, of thinking about it. Or like even back to that, like microbiological, like the idea of you're always kind of already in excess of yourself. So it's not that we are even kind of self-contained, completely discrete beings, which, you know, pandemic droplet <laughs> language <laughs> reveals, you know, like, um, yeah, the, the, the boundaries aren't, aren't so clear. Um, but yeah, no, as far as multimedia, though, I don't necessarily know if I know what you mean. I, I really love this idea. I just, I don't know if I have anything intelligent to say no, that's, that's, about that's right. it. But, um, mm -hmm. We actually have another question. Do you think auto theory gives us tools for tackling notions of authenticity of the self that are lacking in other approaches? Yeah, I would say yes. I would say a definite yes. Um, I think that those tools are still being kind of figured out and described. So I, I am trying to do a bit of that work in this book. I'm trying to think, yeah, what some specific tools would be. Um, but you mean, I, I guess maybe it would be assessing that whether or not there's a gap between the rhetoric and the practice might be one one way of thinking about that, you know, is going back to that that question of the relationship between the the work and the self. 
in a way though, we're getting to such a place of policing people that I think we're expecting people to be kind of perfect subjects in a way that isn't necessarily, <laughs> um, you know, maybe we need to give each other a little bit more leeway, I, I would say in, in feminist spaces and, and art spaces. But, but yeah, I, I would say that maybe that's one way of assessing authenticity would be, uh, yeah, kind of thinking about the relation between what a person's writing and whether, whether they're, you know, practicing what they preach as it were, but it's also like, yeah, from a literary perspective, it's a question I'm, I'm really interested in and still, I think, kind of planting some seeds in the book. I haven't necessarily resolved it, but but yes, this idea of 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 honesty is something I, I think a lot about in the book, you know, um, rhetorics of honesty and how these writers are kind of seeking, like writing toward uh, an honesty that, yeah, that, that I personally as a reader and an academic hold space for and, and believe is possible. Maybe not everyone does, but so inspiring so there's a question in the chat uh, how is auto theory in conversation perhaps with expanding on or differing from something like standpoint epistemology theory hmm. mm -hmm. yeah i would definitely see it as expanding on that so i i i, I posit stand, standpoint theory standpoint epistemology as as one of one of the the points one of the nodes in this longer history for sure. And I feel like that, um, yeah, Tia, thank you for that question. I think that would be another example of, of one of the, um, yeah, kind of constellated points that, well, one of the ways that feminist theory ties in, like one um, standpoint theory was something that came to mind when I started to think about locating an auto theoretical tradition within feminist histories. Mm -hmm. And so theories like standpoint theory, you know, um, the idea that we're you know you're located in a kind of philosophical sense but also and and this is the direction i go at the end of the book really starting to think about uh questions of decolonialization and land and place in the body is that not only are we all kind of located and embodied in a certain way but we're also all you know living and working on specific land and how does that shape the work we're doing too you know what is our relationship to others yes but also what is our relationship to the land so there are a couple other questions, and I think they're related. One asks, is it, are there, are there dangers in auto theory in opening yourself up too much? And I think this is related to another question. Can you talk about the relationship between auto theory and trauma? In what ways mm -hmm. might auto theory allow writers to address various traumas? in ways that might not be possible in memoir or other forms that use linear narratives? Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, that, I love that question. Um, yes, well, so this idea of opening yourself up too much, let me start there, um, because I do feel like that ties back to the, the earlier conversation of, of this idea of disclosures as an act of bravery and um you know requiring a kind of braveness of you know how um you know we're sharing our own life stories but then also how we're being receptive to and, and responding to and listening to the accounts of others but one question that comes up came up in my or sorry one point one term that came to mind when you're reading this person's question is the idea of vicarious trauma so this is something that I encountered when I w worked as a frontline social worker in Vancouver um, as a frontline mental health and harm reduction worker. I had no qualifications to do that work, but I was um, deep in it, doing it. And one of our trainings, one of our few like trainings was with this fantastic woman, Vicki Reynolds, who's in Vancouver. I just think she's brilliant. She has a PhD in, I believe, psychology, but she really stayed rooted in, in um, a kind of lived practice and in the downtown east side. But essentially she had this idea of vicarious trauma that she was theorizing and developing and kind of training folks in where, in the context of me working in this frontline, um, me working in this drop-in space for folks with concurrent disorder, which is the coexistence of a mental illness with um, some kind of substance issue or addiction, is that 
often you are just talking to people all day and sharing stories and listening to people's stories. And what Vicki Reynolds said was, you know, actually there's an element, there's an idea of vicarious trauma that in sharing a story, you know, perhaps without proper contextualization, without proper like preparation, um, without the, the person sharing and the person receiving necessarily having their own psychotherapeutic uh, tools and and um, capacities and uh, state to, to properly receive and process difficult uh, traumatic stories is that what can happen is that not only is the person hearing the story risking being traumatized, but that there's this element of vicarious trauma uh, so they're being traumatized through the vicarious trauma, but then the person telling the story is also sort of being re-traumatized themselves. And that if you don't have the training of like a psychotherapist, for example, who's able to, I, I'm not a psychotherapist, so I don't know, but I'm imagining, you know, they have the tools and and uh, understanding of how to kind of contain these things, how to reframe. And yeah, so so that said, you know, where does auto theory come in? So yes, I do think that's, you know, a risk anytime there's trauma, you think of elements of like content warnings, etc. Though I don't think content warnings necessarily are always I, I think they're important and certainly play a role. But I, I guess I don't necessarily think they fit every context and are like the only answer. So I do think as writers and artists, we need other strategies. So I would think, you know, maybe that's where formal treatment comes in, you know, taking care of your audience and your reader in a way that, you know, you're couching difficult material in a way that's also like taking care. Um, you know, I do think, yeah, it is contextual. I mean, I think of, yeah, I might be kind of wandering off here. I don't know if I, I can you repeat the last part of their question? I'm sorry. I, I don't know if I, um, so it was about about the kind of forms uh, in traumatic narratives that some of them mm -hmm. rely so much on linearity, uh, and that might be different from some of the resources that you find in auto theoretical narratives, right? So resources that mm -hmm. aren't possible in memoir or autobiographic. Yeah. Okay. Well, one example that comes to mind is Carmen Maria Machado's In the Dream House, which I wonder if folks have blushing. Have you read that yet? No, I haven't. It's really beautiful. I feel like you'd love it. But um, I read it this past summer and she's someone who I'm sad I hadn't read before I wrote this book because I don't actually mention her in my book and I would have loved to um, at least name her. But um, but yes, <laughs> Zoe's like, woo. I know she's like ridiculously good writer. <laughs> um, but In the Dream House, that is an example of a form that is writing through trauma. So it's specifically a story of domestic abuse um, in a lesbian relationship. And, but it's told as vignettes that repeat and repeat and repeat in different ways and are constantly being reframed. So, um, you know, it's like in the dream and each page is titled in a way that reframes it. So one of my favorites is like the dream house as stoner comedy. And I was like, what is this book? This is so amazing um but like the dream house as you know like epic poem the dream house as like tragedy and then it's kind of going through these I different totally love it. yeah and it's basically just retelling this account but but it doesn't actually feel repetitive and it's always it, i mean it's that kind of classic iterative structure of, of kind of um of, of using the repetition of trauma but in a way that i think is really formally experimental and, and effective and, and I, I feel like what she's doing would fit the bill of auto theory as well, insofar as there is that awareness of, um, yeah, the awareness of, uh, you know, the stakes of kind of theorizing one's life and kind of the ethics and, and politics of one's one's life. And um, and Carmen Maria Machado is someone who writes in a lot of kind of creative nonfiction forms as well. So she's um, coming from this kind of cross genre tradition of of being someone who writes short stories and poetry, but also also critical essays. Oh, that's really helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another question, and you know, if you have any other final questions, we have about 10 more minutes, so please put those in. Could you reflect on consideration of reader, effects of auto theory on readers and audiences? And I think maybe this comes out from what you were talking about in, in reflecting on trauma and secondary witnessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, so the effects on readers and audiences. I mean, I think there's a similar, maybe there's a, a kind of, yeah, a, a bit of a dual dual effect. Like there, there is that kind of, you know, introspective, um, you're getting a glimpse into a kind of like personal private world that is characteristic of reading genres like autobiography and memoir. Um, but there might just be a little bit more of that element of um, engaging with theoretical concepts as well, or, or kind of uh, philosophical ideas. And I know one term that I use, it's not mine, but I, I cite it in the book is this idea of like, rather than life writing, auto theoretical work is like life thinking, though, arguably, I'm like, isn't all life writing life thinking? <laughs> you know, when you're writing, aren't you always thinking, but there's something about this term auto theory that really wants to like, underscore, highlight the idea of, of a kind of deep critical thinking that's part of part of that process of, of reception or thinking, which isn't to say that there, it's inaccessible or, or necessarily like super heady, but I, I do feel like that there's just an element of, of that kind of uh, criticality alongside a more maybe immersive autobiographical experience. Do you find that your own experience listening to auto theoretical lectures or talks like David Chamiandi's that you talked about at the in the reading or the many mm -hmm. others that you talk about in the book has that changed your own audience response to auto theory as a result of doing the work of writing about auto theory i'm just curious mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I personally have always been really receptive to that kind of work. So maybe, you know, I, I don't feel like weirded out when people get hyper personal <laughs> or something that um, maybe I lack boundaries. I don't know. But it's just, yeah, something about, um, yeah, I feel like I'm the receptive audience member to that kind of work. So maybe it's hard for me to say. But I do know in, in my grad course, we've been talking a lot about, it's been a good reminder for me that, you know, some people are very comfortable living in a kind of full disclosure, post-confessional internet culture. And some people do not want to share anything personal about themselves, you know, in any public capacity. And it, it's, it's, you know, both are fine, I think. It's just kind of interesting that there certainly is such a spectrum. And so even if the way I, I talk about auto theory in this book is, you know, thinking about ideas of us being in a kind of post-confessional time, um, you know, confessional poetry having its roots back in the 50s, and um, the idea that we are in a, a very different uh, period of audience reception when it comes to social media technologies, for example, and the ways that we engage, you know, even in perhaps quite honest or like full on ways with like virtual strangers sometimes. Absolutely, which has been heightened in strange ways by the pandemic as well. True. Um, and these virtual intimacies. Well, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you were maybe the ideal audience for auto theoretical work. <laughs> I want to tell you that you were also the ideal writer of it. Um, this has been mm -hmm. such a beautiful Thank book. Uh, it is, I, I want to urge everyone to read it. I have learned so much. I have enjoyed it. I find it just dazzling. And I hope you'll follow all of Lauren's other work. I don't see any other questions, but I do. I just want to thank you, as someone did in the chat, for this beautiful work. It is really urgent and fierce and important and, um, and beautiful. Thank you so much, Velashni. It really means a lot. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you both so much for that conversation and offering us so many different pathways into this discourse. Um, a reminder that you can buy the book, um, just click the button at the bottom of your screen. And if you know anyone who missed the event, don't worry, we recorded the whole thing. Um, so this is recorded. Um, you can view it here on Crowdcast or I will be uploading um, a, a version with closed captioning on our YouTube channel. Um, so that will be available tomorrow. Thank you both so much. That was such a fascinating, wonderful conversation. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.
Thank you.